I think one of the reasons, one of the reasons I've shown this to actors over the years, or I've shown it to cinematographers, was again to break through, uh, because to break through a kind of um, a prison of the system, you know, in a way. You have so many wonderful young actors who, uh, unfortunately, at times are used by the system. Uh, you know, they come out of an independent film, let's say, you know, and then. Um, uh, they make and they do wonderful performances. Then they put in uh, they put in a big a big Hollywood film, which is about a cartoon character. Um, the film doesn't do too well. The actor doesn't work again, and doesn't work again for maybe two or three years or two or three films, maybe uh, which is like a year and a half. Um, and I think uh, it's uh, it becomes like a monster. It's eating its young, you know. And I think one of the things is to. Uh, is not only that, but the actor also has to deal with, on a big screen, in the system, in the industry, the way it is. And I'm talking about Hollywood, I'm talking about, and even though I'm in New York, my films are still financed by Hollywood. So we have a situation that um, younger people, uh, very uh, talented, uh, the promise of uh, uh, the actors over the years, like a Brando or a Dean or a Montgomery Clift, people like that today, um, sometimes get self-destruct because they're put in a system that uh, has to pay attention every day to the um, to the uh, publicity, uh, to which parties they're going to, to um, uh, uh, which screening they're invited to. You could be invited to you're invited to a screening which is the A list, and you could be on the B list. You find out later you may be on the C list, which means you've lost position in in town. Now this happens all the time. This happens all the time in any industry, particularly in Hollywood. But there's something that that's happened with the society now because of the materialism and the consumerism gone mad and rampant that happens faster. And something like this, something like Rocha's work to show to actors, actors who have a core of of wanting to do something more than than um, becoming part of a system. Um, uh, it might shock them <laughs> into uh, having fortitude and strength and overcoming those problems. You could do it. Some have done it over the years. Some have done it. There have been great actors who started in the 60s who are still working. You know. But I see now what's happening is that uh, people are used up in two, in two days and gone. And I see pictures like this. As, I say, remember, this is also cinema. This also can happen. This is also film. This is also movies. Because cinema sometimes has a bad connotation in terms of becoming, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that is um, uh, counterculture. Uh, and so our dream at the time in the late 60s, I hadn't made films when I met Glauber first, Glauber Rocha, I hadn't made films at that point when I first met him, when I first saw these films. And our dream at the time in this, what happened with that whole group in California, when we went to California, um, was to make new pictures that, uh, um, to make a, to make a new, to make, shall I answer that for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, our, our goal, our goal, we thought, we thought, we thought we were going to make, we thought we were going to make a new cinema of some sort. And this is not just from, it was the decline, I mean, Rocha and many of the people at that time were talking about the decline of the Hollywood system, Hollywood cinema, that's true. But I guess we became a new, a new group that came in and, uh, uh, we tried up until about 1980-81 it lasted and then that was over. Um, that doesn't mean it can't exist, it doesn't mean it still uh, it still can't can't work, I think it can work um, and I think a lot of that ha is happening with American cinema since the late 80s all through the 90s with independent cinema to a certain extent but that can also also fall into a kind of, uh, what's the word, you show pictures to people who already agree with you you know what I'm saying? People who, you get a social topic and you show a very heartfelt film about some sort of social problem, and who's going to argue? Say, ah, it's well made, it's, it is well made, they acted well, but you should go further and use cinema as a language. And now, when these pictures came out, they were talking about 16 millimeter, John Cassavetti shooting faces in 16 millimeter being shown on big screens in America and all over the world, the Maisel Brothers, Penny Baker, all these films being shown on Saturday nights here, at, right around the corner here in major, major theaters, like regular, like regular f features from Hollywood, only made w uh, with a new, a new approach to cinema. 
Um, and um, uh, all over Europe this happening too, and in Japan. And uh, at that time it looked like there would be a new uh, language of cinema in a way, um, and people were redefining it. Uh, now that's upon us again, and it has to do with digital video, and has to do with the ability of anybody to pick up a camera. And once they want to tell a story with that camera, they've got to look through the, the eyepiece. And when you do that, you have to frame it. You have to let the person who's going to see that, you know, understand what you want to tell them, which means you're going to be a filmmaker. Now, if you have something to say, it's a very powerful, a very powerful medium that's happening right now. There's so many different ways. And now there's talk, and I guess it's happening, that, um, again, I'm not sure if this is any, it would, would be cons considered cinema anymore, but... Um, Films like uh, great Hollywood films or films like great European or Asian films, South American films, being shown on iPods. Well, I, I don't know if the film was made to be seen that big on a screen, you know, that small, I should say, and that size. And so that becomes something else. And it's being redefined and re reinvented as we speak. And it's a very powerful medium, you know. I mean, the computer, the Internet, and that sort of thing. This is something that nobody, when these films were made, nobody had thought of. So it's open again. And I think what has to happen is that we have to keep shocking and uh, uh, in a way shaking up the young talent and saying don't get caught up with you know not only in the main system um, but also with the heartfelt independent film. Well the violence in, in Antonio Desmortes is uh, stylized but the problem is that it um, it's not it reminds me of a ritualistic violence. It reminds me of rituals that are played out where people don't get hurt, but one plays out the violence. Um, so there's a distancing in a way. Now, yet, I know that I read about Russia over the years, I know about Bertolt Brecht and all, I never understood that. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I come, as I say, I, it took me years to um, come around to uh, where other people were when these films were made. Um, uh, and I was never an intellectual that way. And, still am not, but the point is that the distancing didn't matter. Um, I still felt the power. I knew, I knew what those images meant, and I knew what that violence meant, even though the violence was not necessarily shown um, realistically, you see. And, and that, that I, don't, I don't say it's good or bad, I'm just saying that, that, it, uh, that it didn't matter to me. Um, and certainly, coming off of um, Bonnie and Clyde Made in America, or The Wild Bunch, or Sam Peckinpah, the, oh, as I say, this, this if anything, uh, is tied directly to the violence um, that was um, uh, expressed or expressed in a certain manner in the Leone films. More Italian, more European, uh, but also Japanese. I also felt a very, a very strong um, uh, association with Japanese cinema too when I saw Roche's pictures, sort of like uh, uh, Japanese and Italian cinema mixed together. I used to say, and, and I was trying to struggle to find out what it was, to find out where all these styles came from. But then I realized too. I think about Terram Trons, and I think I look at it now. And, and uh, it's, you see Wells, you see Orson Wells, you see Eisenstein, of course. You know, and whenever I make a picture, you know, the first thing I do to jumpstart, to, if anything's left, I go, I run uh, Russian films in the 1920s. And it's Eisenstein, Toshenko, Verta, Diga Vertov, some Padovkin, some Kuleshov. But, uh, but now these days, Toshenko, uh, I like a lot. And um, <clears throat> if I can, Antonio Desmortes or Terem Trans, you know, and that's just to push the mind working. That, that's to refresh the memory, or uh, should I say, if there is anything left, to refresh the inspiration, to be inspired, just to be around great cinema, to see it and to be part of it, and just to be in the room. You don't even have to look at it. You could be, you could be there in the room while it's being projected, you know. And so, um, for me, uh, uh, I, I think my eye caught particularly Terram Trons, my eye uh, went directly towards it because I think it's, uh, my eye was attuned to Wellesian cinema, Orson Welles. I liked Welles' films a lot. Um homem não pode se dividir assim. A política e a poesia são demais para um só homem. And so I came from a very conservative background and in the late, in the early 60s is when I started to become aware of um, different ways of thinking, political thinking, and that sort of thing. Um, I was maybe 16 or 18 when this began to happen. And, and so, um, uh, 
in a way, for me, um, I always responded to the poetry. And I think with Russia's pictures, that's what I'm saying. I went in, I responded to the poetry of the film. The politics were there. I said, that's why I said it's beyond the politics, you know, because the poetry is so strong that it's eternal. It, 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 it's about being, it's about mankind. It's not just about a political system and, um, or against a political system. It goes beyond that. Um, that's why it's always, that's why it'll always be fresh and new. And so uh, um, I think for me that if the two can't exist together, the way he says politi politics and poetry can't exist together, the poetry has the politics. No matter what you do, it's political. And I think this is something that, again, the younger people of today could, could uh, maybe uh, 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 benefit from, from seeing in these films. I mean, it's obvious in Terror and Transit because it's about politics in a way. But it's different uh, about politics than the, ways, than the way, say, All the King's Men is. You know, the Robert Penn Warren novel that was made into a film. And this new film coming, a new version coming out on that. It's a different thing. And the thing about Terram Tranza, I mean, is when, when I saw that at the Museum of Modern Art, I never saw a reaction to a film that way. There was the last shot of the man firing, firing the gun. It's widescreen, 185, and he's on the corner of the frame, I remember. And... Uh, after the film was over, somebody, there were two or three people just applauding and applauding and applauding for like 20 minutes. It was moving. It was so overwhelming. I mean, not that, I don't say this where I say pick up a gun and go and shoot, but it has to do with the, it has to, that image is like the most eloquent image of, um, uh, in cinema that expresses that, uh, um, uh, Injustice will always be resisted. Always. One way or the other. Whether we, it's just going to happen. Because he stays on the screen and you hear those gunshots. And this image is, is incendiary. And I saw the reaction in the audience. It was powerful. Um, and so that's poetry. But you can also say it's politics. <laughs> but the poetry is first. So maybe he's right. I got to Glauber uh, Rocha I met over the years. Then I started making films. There's no doubt Antonio Dos Mortes had like a, a major impact on uh, Mean Streets and on Raging Bull. On Raging Bull, we put in some Brazilian music in, in homage to uh, Glauber there's a couple of a couple of pieces of music in there but uh, in any event uh, um, I think last time I saw him was in Venice 1980 I think yeah but before that we had Tom Luddy brought him over to my had a house a small house in Los Angeles and we uh, had a dinner as Tom Luddy myself and Glauber and I showed him uh, the big shave his short I had made and we looked at a John Ford film the horse soldiers yeah the Horse Soldiers, not a great John Ford film, but it had, um, he liked Ford, and he liked Westerns, he told me. Era uma espécie assim de cruzar John Ford com, com Jean Vigo e com Eisenstein. I think it's Antonio, I think. I, but I, I, I go back and forth, uh, there's Land and Anguish and Paravento, but I like, I like um, very much, Antonio's the one I keep checking back with, uh, I keep showing to people, if I think they deserve it. Because <laughs> sometimes people, uh, some some people are gone. I mean, some people like zombies, and no more feeling or something. I don't know. And I think it's good to uh, show it to people who will, you know, that it might help them in their work, or even if they reject it, it's something for them to have a reaction to, rather than what's being presented today. Um, but uh, no, I think it's Antonio. I go back and forth with Antonio. The music is always in my head, and I know it very well. It's fresh. It's new. It doesn't cater to uh, tastes uh, uh, of the box office. Or, I mean, the box office in a bad way. You know, of a traditional. Okay, now we're going to sit you down, tell you a nice story. This this punches you in the face. You see, and wakes you up. It opens your eyes, and that's what you need today, more than ever. I think one of the reasons, one of the reasons I've shown this to actors over the years, or I've shown it to cinematographers, was again to break through 
uh, because to break through a kind of um, uh, a prison of the system, you know, in a way. You have so many wonderful, um, sometimes get self-destruct because they're put in a system that uh, has to pay attention every day to the, um, to the uh, publicity, uh, to which parties they're going to, to um, uh, uh, which screening they're invited to. You could be invited to, you're invited to a screening which is the A list, and you could be on the B list. You'll find out later you may be on this. Young actors who, uh, unfortunately, at times are used by the system. Uh, you know, they come out of an independent film, let's say, mm. you know, and then um, uh, they make, and they do wonderful performances. Then they're put in, uh, they're put in a big, a big Hollywood film, which is about a cartoon character. Um, the film doesn't do too well. The actor doesn't work again. And doesn't work again for maybe two or three years, or two or three films, maybe, uh, which is like a year and a half. Um, and I think uh, it's, uh, it becomes like a monster. It's eating its young, you know. And I think one of the things is to, uh, is not only that, but the actor also has to deal with, on a big screen, in the system, in the industry, the way it is. And I'm talking about Hollywood. I'm talking about, and even though I'm in New York, my films are still financed by Hollywood. So you have a situation that um, younger people, uh, very uh, talented, uh, the promise of uh, uh, the actors over the years, like a Brando or a Dean or Montgomery Clift, people like that of today,